From our studio in our office at the corner of 8th and Walton in Bentonville, Arkansas, welcome to Saturday Morning Meeting. Brought to you in part by Dun & Bradstreet Credibility Corp., the leading provider of credit and credibility solutions for businesses. Saturday Morning Meeting covers Walmart, Sam's Club, and the consumer product companies that are represented on the racks and shelves throughout the country and around the world. Our focus is on the insights, trends, and best practices to help you as a supplier grow your business with the world's largest retailer. I'm Andy Shook, and thanks for joining us. Today, in Swimming in a Sea of Data, Jeff Amrine talks with Ryan Frazier about how social listening is affecting the CPG industry. And then, we'll meet Reagan McClellan, Rudy Leschke, and Steve Joyce of Ainsworth Pet Nutrition to discuss two brands and their marketing strategies. But first, the headlines. Analysts, suppliers, and retailers alike eagerly anticipated Walmart's announcement of its second quarter earnings. Walmart reported consolidated net sales of 2.8% over last year, something that caused concern among analysts. Sam's Club earnings were likewise flat, although the Warehouse Club also saw an 11.9% increase in membership income. Most significant, however, is the 24% increase in e-commerce sales. With several international markets, such as the United Kingdom, China, and Brazil, enjoying double-digit growth in online sales. Now, we've been reporting on how dollar stores continue to flourish in an economy where cash-strapped consumers have to count every penny. Walmart's been trying to respond to this trend in different ways, including the introduction of a new private label brand that offers significant price savings over branded goods. Price First began testing last year, and foodbusinessnews.com reports that the brand is now in 2,500 stores nationwide. Now, the range currently includes about 50 items, including staples such as peanut butter and pasta. Walmart is a popular destination for holiday shopping. But sometimes those everyday low prices can mean long lines. MSN Money reports that Walmart plans to alleviate checkout congestion by making a checkout promise between Black Friday and right before Christmas. Walmart store managers will assign associates to every cash register during peak shopping times. Now, this move by Walmart is in keeping with its renewed commitment to customer service and will hopefully encourage more in-store shopping. Walmart's recent U.S. marketing summit in Denver was more than just a pep rally for domestic goods. In fact, the meeting served to address a real challenge for suppliers, finding manufacturing operations in the United States that can efficiently produce products. Daily Finance reports that the summit allowed Walmart to play matchmaker between manufacturers and suppliers, resulting in partnerships that will help Walmart reach its sourcing goals. Like Walmart, Target is also working to get customers back into its stores. WearTV.com recently reported that Target stores will stay open later in the evening to accommodate late-night shoppers. Now, it remains to be seen if the plan will actually work. Some retail studies show that few people are inclined to shop late at night. Well, we'll keep you posted. The retail world was recently rocked by the news that Dollar Tree had made a bid for Family Dollar, and now Dollar General has come along with a multi-billion dollar bid of its own. Now, as we wait for the dust to settle, some analysts, such as Laura Heller at Forbes.com, have noted that Walmart's fiercest competition may be coming from dollar stores instead of other large department or big box stores. While we still don't know how the family dollar bidding war will end, the current climate suggests that Walmart's emphasis on small store development is a smart one. A few years ago, Drew Barrymore partnered with Walmart to develop the Flower Cosmetic line. Now she is launching three new fragrances sold only at Walmart, according to a report at Lucky.com. The perfumes make their debut in October, just in time for the holidays. This week on Swimming in a Sea of Data, Jeff Amarine and Ryan Frazier of DataRank discuss the effects of social listening and the future of data analytics. Today I'm here with Ryan Frazier, co-founder and CEO of DataRank. DataRank is one of the emerging leaders within the social listening space. Ryan, welcome. Glad to have you here. Yeah, thank you. Tell us a little bit about DataRank and really kind of define what social listening is and how that might be relevant to CPG and, and retail decision makers. Sure, and thanks for having me today. Glad to have you. Uh, so DataRank is a company really focused on 
data, insights, and a lot of that goes back to social listening today because it's a really exciting space in consumer and social insights. Um, when we think about social listening, a lot of times people go to like Twitter and Facebook, um, sometimes Pinterest or YouTube. Um, but for us, it really goes beyond just those large social networks and really some of the niche um, data sources as well. So things like forums within golf, where people are really talking heavily about very the golf specific, industry. not the, not the yeah. usual suspects. Very specific things where some of those insights might come from that are unexpected. Yeah, where you know, as someone may. Um, say, I'm going golfing today on Twitter, they may actually talk about the clubs and the shoes um, that they're using on the golf course sure. today. And, um, so whenever you drill to those kind of more niche data sources as well, um, you start to get a richer data set. Um, and so a big focus of ours is making sure that we're getting, you know, not just the major social networks, right. but really the full breadth of everywhere people are talking. How, about. how is that somewhat disruptive or different from the way those sorts of insights would have been gleaned in the past? What are you guys doing that's really changing the game? Yeah. One of the biggest differences is just the speed with which you can get the data today. Um, in the past, you know, you might do a focus group or a survey and it takes months to get any type of uh, feedback from that. Sure. Whereas a great example of just kind of the speed is um, one of our customers had kind of an issue that arose where mainstream media was really talking negatively about one of their products. There was a concern it might actually get pulled off the shelf. Um, the retail partners were concerned what that was going to do to the product launch and within 20 24 hours, they could see what do actual real consumers think? What do the parents think? And what do our customers think? Um, and in this particular case, you know, it actually didn't align with mainstream media. They felt like it's not a big issue. Um, the product wasn't going to have to be recalled. Um, and so they were able to share that data back to their retail partners, calm those concerns. It's actionable, actionable information, and it kind of it kind of quelled what otherwise they might have perceived as being a big problem. Yeah, I mean it's it's actionable today. Um, How do you see? What are some other use cases where you see retail and CPG decision makers and analysts using social listening to make a difference in their business? Mm -hmm. Um, so a lot of the area, especially you know, with us being based out of Northwest Arkansas, a lot of the teams that we're working with are um, category management or shopper and customer insights or brand management. And so a lot of our case studies are within those areas. Mm -hmm. um, one of the great things about digital data and all this online data from a category perspective is you're not just looking at or doing a focus group on your own products. You get to see the full category um, of all of the brands and benchmark your brand against against you know, all of your competitors. It's like real-time real competitive landscape. Mm -hmm. that's, re that's really interesting. Y you know, one of the things that I've wondered about a lot is you look at social listening, you look at point of sale data, and you look at some of the in-store data that's being gathered through iBeacons and whatnot. Mm -hmm. How do you see all those pieces coming together? Yeah, I think that's absolutely the next step that we're kind of seeing progress right now in bringing social listening um, to the next level. And it really does require validation of all of those um, additional data sources. So validating things like changes in sentiment back to POS data lets us say, you know, how quickly um, does a negative reaction to a new product or a new attribute um, really impact sales? Right. Um, a lot of times you'll see a spike in negative sentiment, let's say, um, whenever there's a change in the product. Right. Um, you may not see that take effect for three, six, or nine months actually in POS sales because of the purchase cycle for some of these products being so long. Mm -hmm. So you have a loyal consumer who you know, will buy it once and they'll have a slightly negative reaction because sure. it's different, and then they may try it one more time before they ultimately say, you know, we're gonna switch. I got it. Um, and so by tying that you know, all back to POS data, you can really start to get a lot more predictable Sure. about how things like sentiment changes and uh, you know, other attributes that we're tracking. Are there, are there other sales. innovations that you're seeing that are coming down the pike that are going to be game changers in this whole yeah. space of data analytics and decision science? What are you seeing? So a big one that we're focusing on and we've seen other companies kind of delving into a bit more as well is really the last frontier and really the last kind of advantage that focus groups and surveys had, which was more uh, in-depth demographic information. Um, so now we're finding really that accurate profiles really accurate you know who the customer is in a, in a very tangible way privacy concerns around that how do you manage that piece of it? so the privacy side of it is you know, only pulling that publicly available information uh, and so that's how we uh, focus on that it's really you know being very strict to that if it's hell if they've set their privacy settings to 
not allow you to view the conversation, um, then we absolutely adhere to that. Ryan, those are, those are fantastic insights. We're, we're a little short on time today. I'd really be interested in having you come back at some point and talk about how you get the talent that's got the data analytical skills to, to be good team members for you. I mean, talent acquisition is a big deal now. Would you be willing to come back here sometime in the future? Yeah, absolutely. That yeah. sounds great. Thanks again for coming, and we really appreciate it. Saturday morning meeting will continue shortly, and look forward to next week's edition of Swimming in the Sea of Data. Every day, shoppers are bombarded with traditional brand messages outside the store in hopes that these marketing dollars will drive in-store sales. Closure Media drives retail sales by connecting brands with 95 million Walmart shoppers per year while they are in the store. Through innovative programs at Walmart's photo and money centers, Closure Media converts Walmart shoppers to purchasers of your brand. With reported redemption rates up to seven times the national FSI average, Closure Media drives sales. For more info, visit us at ClosureMedia.com. 8th and Walton, the premier destination for Walmart supplier education. When and where you want to learn. Current, accurate, relevant, taught by suppliers for suppliers. 8th and Walton. GigWalk is an on-demand mobile workforce that can collect data and do work at retail. Businesses use GigWalk for retail audits, merchandising, and much more. With 350,000 smartphone-enabled workers available on demand, you get unprecedented speed and coverage across the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. And all work is reviewed for quality and accuracy. Visit GigWalk.com to learn more. Bentonville Commerce, less than one mile from the Walmart home office. You'll love the convenience, amenities, and customized options Bentonville Commerce offers. For more information or a tour, call 479-200-1112 today. Your success with Walmart depends on being able to use Retail Link accurately and with confidence. Designed for both the beginner and the super waiting for a refresher, this course takes a hands-on approach to the most common aspects of Retail Link. In this one-day course, you'll learn how to navigate Retail Link with ease, how to personalize your dashboard, and how to build a query. Become a smarter supplier. Contact 8th and Walton today. Up next, we meet with Reagan McClellan, Rudy Leschke, and Steve Joyce of Ainsworth Pet Nutrition. We discuss the collaboration with Walmart to develop a specialty dog food and celebrity branding. All right, today we're here with Reagan McClellan and Dr. Rudy Leschke of Ainsworth Pet Nutrition to talk about the collaboration with Walmart to produce a line of pet food. Welcome, thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. So, tell us a little bit about Ainsworth Pet Nutrition and the company's history. Well, Ainsworth was founded in 1933. It is a family-owned company, and for 80 years, we have been focused on just pets. Um, we're in our fifth generation of family leadership, and it's a wonderful company to work for. The really exciting part is that it was founded with a love of pets. So George Ainsworth Lang, our founder in 1933, had a Springer Spaniel who had puppies. Okay. and um, made So this is an American company? Yes. Okay, great. Production fac facilities in the USA. Um, and since it started in 1933, we've, we've made it here. Great. So one of Ainsworth's lines of pet food is Pure Balance, right? And can, it can only be found in Walmart, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, how did this relationship with Walmart begin? So Walmart had a relationship with Ainsworth. We developed the Kibbles Chunks and Chews product under Old Roy, and we had been providing that for many years. And is that a dog food or a cat food? Dog food. Oh, dog food. It's okay. a kibble dog food, yeah. It's a Kibbles, uh, kibbles and Bits amulet. Okay. But... Um, we had just recently launched a super premium food and grocery, super premium pet food, and uh, we had just added some talent to our R&D and marketing groups. So Walmart saw an opportunity to bring super premium food in the grocery and saw us as a partner that uh, could make that happen. And when you introduced this line of products, was it underneath what, private label or was it uh, actually as a... Uh it was our own brand. It was your own brand. Yeah. Okay. And that brand is? Rachel Ray Nutrish. Okay. Great. So what was unique about Walmart's go-to-market strategy with, uh, with Pure Balance? Well, Walmart was really a pioneer here. It was a unique situation, and they really um, took a risk that reaped a lot of rewards. So um, at the time, pet specialty brands weren't bringing their nutrition into grocery and mass, leaving a gap for the consumer. So if a consumer wanted pet specialty type brands, they were going to pet specialty. And Walmart said, I want that available for my consumer. As a private label. 
uh, they, they just wanted it any, uh, in grocery okay. whatsoever. Okay. Um, and so Walmart saw that and said, you know what, I'm gonna offer that, and really unique, I'm gonna offer that as a private label. So no other U.S. Um, grocery mass retailer was offering a private label of this level of nutrition. Walmart said, we're going to do it. And it was a huge success. So, and how was it marketed to the Walmart customers? So we really worked with a uh, low to no budget uh, marketing plan. And I, I have to give a lot of credit to our buyer, Tim Dodge here. He went and really just pounded the pavement of getting every Walmart vehicle that is a low, no cost. So for instance, we put shelf signs up. We had that executed at the store. We okay. use the Walmart World ad um, to educate associates about the food. We um, got into tabs, uh, typically an area where Walmart can make a lot of money on the brands. He was able to do that at a no cost. So we got the word out there. Well, this, this kind of follows Walmart's plan for EDLP strategy. Absolutely. In other words, if, if, if you guys have to raise your cost, so that you can do the marketing, it mm -hmm. kind of defeats the purpose of everyday low price. And we wanted to offer at least 40% savings to the consumer versus a pet specialty. 40%? Brand. Yeah, so a consumer can buy a formula that's as good if not better than pet specialty brands at a 40% savings. And we're able to do that without the marketing budget. So, so Walmart is saving money even for the dogs and the yes. cats in the world. Okay, so now, okay, shelf space at Walmart is incredibly valuable, but Walmart made space for you guys, why? Pure balance had to be different. Right, it had to be a product that would sell itself. So we designed it not to be a national brand equivalent like private label products typically are. We designed okay. it to be better than the national brand, right? So the product has attitude, the product has character, <laughs> right? It's all about being simple and clean and purposeful. The ingredients we use are there for a reason. Every ingredient does something positive for the animal. And we wanted the product to be a product where the consumer could try it and see the results, right? The product has to sell itself. And so what, what kind of results do they see? Is it the improved, healthiness of the coat? Yeah, uh, improved skin and coat. You know, one of my favorite performance measures is backyard cleanup. <laughs> you, have a, you have a good digestible diet, and you know that's one of the first things you notice. So it's a good product. Um, it's one of the best products that we have out there. It competes with what's in pet specialty. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a wonderful reason for those shoppers to come to Walmart. Now, what made the partnership between Ainsworth and Walmart so successful? Well, there was definitely trust and collaboration and, and a really high level of it. So Walmart trusted our expertise. They didn't um, dictate a formula to us. They said, you have 80, experience, 80 years of experience in pet food help us create this food. And, and Rudy, with the experience that he has, was able to develop this fantastic food without handcuffs of this is what it needs to be. Um, so there was a trust that came to us from Walmart, and then we trusted Walmart that they could make it work. No one else had done this before. And there's a lot of testing, a lot of money that went into development, and just like, testing again and again and again to make sure it was perfect. So Ainsworth spent a lot of resource, and we trusted that, um, Ainsworth could, or that Walmart could make this work. Now, as I understand it, this, you, you introduced this, what, like almost 2009? But then it took a few years before it even... Be started development in 2009. Yeah. It was introduced in 2012. So even, even when you start that collaborative relationship with Walmart, sometimes it doesn't always go exactly like you hoped, but eventually it works out? Yes, actually, um, there was a lot of resource put together by um, Ainsworth, and we collaborated with the team, and it got shelved at the time. I mean, this was a big risk for oh, Walmart to take. Right, right. And it was really um, Tim Dodge's passion for the product mm. and ability to take this risk and want to take this risk that he brought it back to life. He dusted it off, put it off, brought it off the shelves, and launched it. And um, to his credit, it's been a fantastic I, brand. I love it when you get buyers that are willing to take risks. Yes. It makes it so much more fun, doesn't it? Well, hey, thank you so much for coming in today. It sounds like you guys have a great relationship going with Walmart, and thanks for sharing it with us today. Thank you. Coming up next, I'll be joined by Steve Joyce, also of Ainsworth, to talk about a line of pet food backed by one of America's favorite food personalities. Saturday morning meeting, we'll be right back. Bentonville Plaza, across the street from the Walmart home office. The best office location offers proximity and services like no other business complex in the area. Call 479-200-1112 today. 
K-Stack, the leader in collaborative retail consolidation programs. We offer the supply chain expertise needed to navigate the challenges of selling products with the world's largest retailers. And we provide customers with a customizable, scalable, environmentally sustainable supply chain with the same advanced technology typically used by larger rivals. By leveling the playing field, K-Stack lowers distribution costs and increases overall margins. K-Stack, retail logistics is what we do. I would recommend Ethan and Walton to other suppliers because from my experience talking to other suppliers, they were even learning new ideas or just new and better business practices. Most people have little time for training and so Ethan and Walton is a perfect opportunity to send your new employees to understand the retailing system and again because trainers were suppliers, they know the how and the why so they become very valuable very quickly. All right, now I'm here with Ainsworth's Steve Joyce to talk about pet food and celebrity branding. Okay, so how did a family-owned pet food company from Western Pennsylvania get connected with a national celebrity to produce a food product or a dog food product? Well, the, the short answer is email stalking. But what actually, email stalking? Yeah, what actually happened was someone who works at our company, her and her husband, were watching a late-night show with Cusimano, John Cusimano, who's Rachel's husband, and Rachel and the dog came out and the husband of the woman who works with us said, you've got to get them on a pet food brand. You've got to work with them. And she said, yes, we do. That's a great idea. And she was a big Rachel fan, this woman who works with us. So her and her husband basically searched AOL emails for John Cusimano's name, emailed him. Really? Yeah, and he said, he wrote back, yeah, we're interested. We've been looking to do this. Let's talk. And they loved the fact that we were a family-owned company. They loved the fact that we weren't involved in the recall in 2007. Yes. So it was, it, was, it, was a, it was a very cool thing for them. I think they preferred working with us versus a, versus a big company. And she's a real down-to-earth, approachable kind of person. Great. So did she come and meet with you guys then? Or did yeah, she work so through some intermediate? No, we, we went and met with her. Okay. You know, she's, she, people don't know that she writes all her own recipes. I questioned her on that once and was scolded for being <laughs> completely wrong about that. But she writes all her own stuff works very hard, so she was very involved at the beginning, what the brand's gonna be, where it's gonna be launched. There's a debate whether it should be in pet specialty or mainstream. We were adamant about it being in mainstream. We thought that's where the white space was, the food and mass versus pet specialty. She bought into that and Great. the rest is history. So what was the strategy to create a demand for Rachel Ray? Well, there, there, there was white space in food and grocery. So we, I think Rudy and Reagan talked a little bit about this earlier, but basically you've got these exclusive brands in the pet specialty channel okay. and those benefits didn't exist in the grocery channel. So we were able to bring those to grocery with someone that people was very credible. Rachel's very credible to the consumer. She has a food equity, yeah. right? She cooks. Right. This is about food. And there was just, you know, you price it right. It's affordable. It has the benefits. And people just really took to it. It's, it's been the fastest growing brand in food and mass for five straight years. It just keeps going and going. Really? And, going. and how did Walmart play a role in that? So Walmart got on board early had a lot of patience for us because we didn't grow quite as fast out of the gate. Yeah. And then they, they also jumped on well, board. Some of these specialty brands at Walmart, I mean, they do take time. And yeah. if, the buyer, if the buyer has patience, I, I mean, I think it really does pay off. Yeah, and the other thing I think that helps at Walmart, you've got buyers who are empowered, they know their category, they've right. been on the desk for a while, they're not afraid to take a chance with a smaller company or on a new idea. Not that all customers are like this, but some customers have younger buyers who aren't necessarily as comfortable going away from the big guys. Right. Walmart did that. They grew with us, and as a result of their coming in with us, they've had a disproportionate percentage of our sales. And, right. that's, and that's great for them because we bring new users to the category. We're bringing people from pet Well, And when you can do that, yeah. when you can bring innovation, new users to the category, right. and you know, th you're not necessarily hitting the hurdle rates of an old Roy or you know, something right. like that, but you're still bringing those new consumers in. That, that, that does help the buyer. Yeah, and, we, and we, you know, at first we weren't hitting hurdle rates, and now you know, we've got top SKUs. We've got, even this year, we had great expansion on points of distribution. It's, it's been a great partnership. I think I give a lot of credit to Walmart for partnering with us, seeing what this could be, and then taking a shot. So what was the most effective part of launching the brand? You know, I think, well, so I'm going to give you more than one answer, but I think that <laughs> in general it was there was a white space, it's priced right, it's a good product, right? So you got to start there. But then we really focused on less mass media awareness and more really targeting the pet specialty consumer. Okay. So we would send all kinds of samples to consumers. If they lived in a Walmart zip code and they bought pet specialty brands, we'd send them samples. It's a, it's a tough move for a super premium shopper to switch their pet food. And what about the, the brand name with Rachel Ray on it? That, that helps, did, that totally helps. Okay. So we have a great equity as well. You know, she's a cook. She knows food, she's credible, and she loves pets. Yeah, so she has she, a dog, right? Yeah, she has a dog. I've seen her 
she's she's a tough cookie, but she's I've seen her choke up about her dog. And I think <laughs> you, you know you'll probably get to this later, but she donates all of her proceeds to uh, shelters and animal rescue. So she's donated almost seven million dollars to pets wow. from this product. Wow. And it's because she's so passionate about it. No, she's passionate about other charities as well. She's got a charity for children. But those who know Rachel know she loves her dog, know she loves Izabu. Izabu's on the package on some of these brands. <laughs> she feeds Izabu these, these items. And, and it, just, it just was a great fit, great fit for the brand. And so you have a unique program with Nutrish that helps animals in need? Yeah, it's called Rachel's Rescue. Again, her proceeds she donates to help animals in need. She's helped small shelters, big shelters, ASPCA, North Shore. Uh, in, and right down to like mom and pop. So she donates her proceeds. Okay. She, she just cares deeply about animals. Like I said, she loves her pet. She hates to see uh, dogs or cats be euthanized. Yeah. She's really trying to save lives. So right now, this product is in um, dog food form only or no, is it just, over in dog treats? Or We're what? in dog treats, we're in wet and dry dog. We launched cat dry and wet this year. Oh, okay. So yeah, it just keeps. Keep so you're going to continue to innovate, continue yeah. to build that brand and bring things out, and, and it sounds like that it's working out real well. Yeah, it's, yeah we're proud of it, for sure. Great. All right, so hey, thanks again for talking with us today, Steve, and thanks for all of the great things Ainsworth is doing for our four-legged friends. Saturday morning meeting will continue right after this. You know, the biggest challenge of working with Walmart is they really expect everyone on the team to know their language, know their terminology, and know exactly how they do business. So that's where Ethan Walton really comes into play. You know, it's the fastest way to get my team members up to speed. Their business model is suppliers teaching suppliers. So when you come to Ethan Walton, you can count on having very experienced trainers who understand how suppliers work within Walmart, and they take advantage of that and incorporate that into their curriculum. My colleagues and I were lucky enough to have a custom course put together for us by Ethan Walden, IRS, our instructor. It focused on all the different aspects of what an analyst might need from retailing to work with Walmart. I think what surprised me most is that there were so many things that I had not been using in Retail Link that would be valuable for me and that I hadn't attempted to use yet. Um, and also just some tips and shortcuts. IRS had a lot, has a lot of experience and she knows how to help you find things that are going to help you do your work. Our thanks to all of today's guests. Join us next week when we talk with Jay Whitmer of Cleveland Research about a consumer survey that reveals future spending patterns. And Jeff Amrine talks to Jay Thornton of Cusack and Company about customer acquisition. As always, we appreciate your taking the time to join us. Now, if you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. I'm Andy Shook, and from all of us at Saturday Morning Meeting, thanks for watching.